From convicts bawling, smirking, and even taking a swing at officers, get ready to see some stone-cold cop killers reacting to the most ruthless sentences. Disclaimer. Number 1. Otis McCain. After hearing the verdict, he starts to undress, and that's not even the worst thing he does in the courtroom. Otis was charged with capital murder. On the morning of November 20th, 2016, Detective Benjamin Marconi, a 20-year veteran of the San Antonio Police Department, was sitting in his patrol car in front of the police headquarters, checking the information of a driver he had pulled over. Suddenly, a black car pulled up behind his cruiser and a man got out. He ran to the officer's window with a gun, opened fire, and made a clean getaway. Emergency calls went out and officers hurried to the scene, but it was too late for Detective Detective Benjamin, who died at the hospital. The police released images of the suspect's car and footage of the same man at the police headquarters just hours before the shooting. A massive search ensued, and the police pulled all the stops to catch the killer. By the next day, they had the shooter's name. 31-year-old Otis McCain. While police searched for him, Otis went to Bexar County Courthouse to get married. Eventually, the police found him and kept a close eye on him as they waited for the perfect moment to make an arrest. 30 hours after the shooting, a SWAT team moved in on Otis as he drove along the interstate in a white sedan. He was arrested without incident. As shocking as what he did after the cold and calculated murder was, everyone was puzzled to learn why he'd targeted the detective. Otis said, he was angry with the court system because he'd not been allowed to see his son during a custody battle. But the officers who brought him in said Otis had told them something completely different. I started making statements, which was I glad, he's glad that uh, I shot him. You can't judge me. He says I felt good to do what I did. Um, and I finally got somebody to listen. Yet, after a few days behind bars, Otis would deny everything. I'm doing okay besides the fact that people think I killed a police officer. He claimed someone was impersonating him and even played the victim. Um, because I've been falsely accused or they accused me of a situation that I refuse to talk about. Otis was charged with capital murder and facing the death penalty. After several delays, he had his day in court. Witness after witness took the stand, describing the shooting in detail. I know he did something, but whenever I saw him, he went like that and he kept going back, back to the car. Tell the jury why you picked Picture number three, and signed and dated it. Because I was 80% sure that was the gentleman that I saw running towards the uh, patrol vehicle. We had tried to do something quickly, so I, I had turned his head to the side to pour the blood out of his mouth to try and help establish an airway. I didn't know who it was, but it's just, I know it's one of us. What? It's <laughs> Once you saw who it was, what did you then do? Uh, I ran out and I started telling everybody because nobody knew who he was. One witness, the crime scene tech, presented evidence from the horrific scene. Two videos were played in the courtroom. One of the videos showed the moment Otis shot the detective. It was so brutal that a juror threw up right there. In the other video, Otis admitted to the shooting during an interrogation. I'm sorry, I apologize. That was the stupidest thing I've ever done in my life. As he watched it, Otis wiped tears from his face one of the only times he ever showed emotion in the courtroom. The defense only spent 25 minutes making their case, the same time the jury spent before returning with a guilty verdict. At first, Otis seemed indifferent, but soon he was unbuttoning his shirt. Once the jury left the courtroom, Otis sat and placed his head in his hands. When the bailiff approached him to lead him out, Otis stood up and attacked the bailiff with his elbow. Three officers quickly tackled him to the ground, and several more rushed after him. There's no telling what else happened happened behind those doors, but Otis was on his best behavior at his sentencing the following week. Detective Benjamin's daughter addressed her father's killer for the first time. I have always thought of myself as a strong person, but since then it feels like, you, like I have to be stronger because he was such a strong person and I want that to stay alive. Otis stared ahead, probably recalling his one prayer. 
Unfortunately for Otis, that was precisely what he got. He was sentenced to death. This time, Otis kept his elbow to himself and he was let out of the courtroom. If Otis McCain sounds like the poster child of making stupid decisions, trust me, Richard Rotter is giving him a run for his money. Up next, we have Richard Rotter. This drug-dealing, gun-wielding cop killer had the most shocking thing to say when he was about to get sentenced. Richard faced four charges, including aggravated first-degree murder, unlawful possession of a firearm, and possession of a controlled substance. On March 25, 2022, Everett Police Officer Dan Roca interrupted his afternoon patrol with a stop for his iced decaf at Starbucks. He was waiting for his order when a man moving guns between two vehicles in the parking lot caught his attention. Dan immediately called for backup and radioed in the vehicle's license plate. Then he exited the coffee shop and approached the man, asking him about the guns. Hey, how's it going? Do me a favor, bud. Leave the guns alone, okay? What's going on with the guns? Oh, that's it. Richard said they were BB guns. After patting him down, the officer got his ID. It didn't take long before Dan learned that the man's name was Richard Rotter and he had criminal records dating back to the 1980s. He also had an arrest warrant out. Officer Dan asked Richard about the guns again. And you're saying that's a BB gun, not a regular gun. Is that correct? This time, Richard admitted they were real. It's, a, it's, a, it's an old gun. My buddy got it. So it's a gun, not a BB gun. Yeah, so why'd you lie to me and tell me it's a BB gun? Because it's basically what... Because you're a convicted felon and you're not supposed to have a firearm, <laughs> right? Dan told him they would wait for backup and Richard grew increasingly agitated. Oh, no. Okay, so we're going to hang tight till my partner gets here. Oh, hold on, hold on. Don't go, towards, don't go towards the car. I'm you just saying. You understand me. I'm just saying. Look at me. I'm just saying. You're sir. not listening. All right, turn around. Face away from me. You're being detained. With his criminal record, Richard knew exactly where he was headed. He struggled as Dan tried to get the cuffs on him. Put your hand behind your back. Do you understand? Yeah. <laughs> Once Richard broke free, he got a gun hidden in a shoulder holster and fired at the officer five times. Then Richard made his getaway, backing over Officer Dan's body as he drove off. After a brief pursuit, the Everett police caught up with Richard when he crashed into two vehicles. He was arrested and taken into custody for the murder of Officer Dan. At first, Richard said he planned to plead guilty to all charges, but days later, he stunned the court by pleading not guilty. Not guilty. All right, not guilty, please. We'll enter. His trial began in April 2023 with the prosecuting officers painting a grim picture of Richard's actions that fateful day. Witnesses took the stand, describing Dan's final moments. And I saw Officer Rocha on his back in the parking lot, and he quickly put it in reverse and ran over Officer Rocha as he left the scene. Uh, you know, I could keep his heart beating and his family could see him one more time. Uh, by me doing CPR, if that's all that that, that was. But that's kind of where my mind was. Some were so overwhelmed with emotion that they were barely able to speak. Do you remember, did you check for a pulse? Yes. Did you find any, sir? The prosecution played the video of the exchange in court and Richard wiped tears from his eyes. His defense team argued that the murder couldn't be premeditated because Richard had PTSD from his former arrests and drug use. The jury did not agree. In a courtroom packed with Everett police officers, Richard was found guilty on all charges. At the sentencing, Richard apologized to the family Dan had left behind and his family. First and foremost, I wanna express my sincere apologies to the wife, his two sons, Daniel Roaches. My sincere apologies to the Rocha family, as well as to my family and everyone this tragedy has affected. His plea for leniency was a declaration of faith that had been missing for much of his life. I am a Christian and I have fallen. It says in the word, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I just ask that you just please remember that. The judge didn't buy this change of heart, and he had strong words for him. Your actions on that day actually put us more at risk. Because while there's several people, I'm sure, 
that are thinking and have thought about being a police officer, I think a lot of them will rethink it because police officers have too often recently become targets. While the judge acknowledged Richard's mental disorders, the judge had no problem sentencing Richard to life in prison. Richard Rotter suddenly remembering religion might seem very convenient, but at least he tried to show some remorse. Nothing is going to prepare you for what Andrew Romero did in court. Meet Andrew Romero. His reaction to hearing his brutal sentence will leave you cold. Andrew faced 10 charges, including first-degree murder, tampering with evidence, and shooting from a vehicle. May 25th, 2015 was memorial. Memorial Day, and Tabitha Littles was behind the wheel as she and her boyfriend, Andrew Romero, drove around Albuquerque, New Mexico. The two had robbed a Taco Bell earlier to buy drugs and were now looking for another place to hit. Officer Greg Benner, an Air Force veteran with the Rio Rancho Police Department, was minutes away from ending his shift when he noticed the license plates on the car ahead didn't match the car's registrations. He pulled the car over and got the driver's license of the woman driving, barely paying attention to the man in the passenger seat. He was back in his car running a check when the car took off. Greg chased after them. At one point, Andrew shoved Tabitha out of the moving car. After checking if she was okay, the officer ran towards the car and Andrew opened fire, hitting him multiple times. One bullet pierced through Tabitha's foot. Then Andrew zoomed off. Nearby residents rushed to the officer's aid, but he didn't make it. A multi-agency citywide search began across Albuquerque as police raced against the clock to find the killer. Six and a half hours after the shooting, 911 calls came in about a robbery at a gas station. It was Andrew driving a different car. Officers on the scene soon noticed a strange car in the area. As they tried to stop it, it zoomed off. During the pursuit, they saw the driver toss an object from the car. It was a gun. The officers soon caught up with him and placed him under arrest. Both Andrew and Tabitha were charged with first-degree murder. She took a plea deal to testify against Andrew. Behind bars, Andrew was far from an ideal person prisoner and soon facing another charge for assaulting a guard. The trial began in 2017 with prosecutors showing the courtroom a video of the frantic moments after the shooting when the emergency workers tried to save him. Several officers and his wife, Julie, watched the clip in tears. It got too much for her and she left the courtroom. The court also heard Andrew's phone call to his family while he was behind bars. Well, I posted it on Facebook and I told them that, you know, what's done is done and that, that right now all you the the thing that you need the most from all of us as a family is, is your, your support. You're all over the news. Everybody knows. He'd laughed when he mentioned shooting his girlfriend. Yeah, how you shot her in the foot. <laughs> but uh, uh, but uh, she's saying now that that uh, now that she realized that her own f-ing mouth has her in the same position as you, because they're they're going to charge. They want to charge her with uh, accessory. Tabitha took the stand, describing Officer Greg's final moments. She also said that Andrew didn't want to stop the car because he was on probation and already had a lengthy criminal history, including voluntary manslaughter. The defense argued that Andrew was too high to know what he was doing and that his DNA on the gun didn't prove he was the shooter. They also pointed out that Tabitha had lied multiple times during the investigation. After 45 minutes, the jury returned with a guilty verdict. At his sentencing, Andrew was back in the courtroom with a nasty smirk on his face. Friends and family in the courtroom got a chance to address Andrew and push the judge for a harsh sentencing. The defense tried to drum up sympathy for him. It has been easy to paint him into a devil and a monster, and he's going to spend the rest of his life in a concrete box. But the prosecution had the last word. There are a lot of victims in this case, but I'm sorry, Andrew Romero is not one of them. The judge had brutal words for Andrew. What I would really like to happen to you, I can't say in court because I'd probably be removed from office. He sentenced him to life in prison without parole with five final words. You will die in prison. Andrew had one more smirk as he was taken away to begin serving his time. That same day, Tabitha was sentenced to 16 years for conspiracy to commit armed robbery and harboring a felon in exchange. At a separate sentencing for violating his probation, Andrew was given an added 10 years to his sentence. Even though Andrew Romero got on the judge's wrong side, Kyle Williams' behavior in the court was far more disturbing. This is Kyle Williams. After cold-bloodedly executing 
an officer and showing no remorse, this teen thought a few well-placed tears would get him off the hook. Kyle is charged with first-degree capital murder. At 10.15 p.m. on the night of December 18, 2011, Lakeland police officer Alnufo Crispin was responding to a report of suspicious activity at Crystal Grove Park, a popular drug-dealing area. He spotted a group of teens and immediately radioed in for backup. Minutes later, backup arrived just in time to see three people running off and jumping the fence that surrounded the park. Inside, they found Arnufo unresponsive from a shot to the head. He was declared brain dead at the hospital. A search for the shooter and a $20,000 reward was offered for information leading to the arrest of the culprits. Police soon found three of the teens. They said the shooter was 19-year-old Kyle Williams. Multiple law enforcement agencies worked hand-in-hand, -hand, deploying helicopters and tracking dogs to find him. Ten hours later, Kyle turned himself in, but he denied pulling the trigger and said he'd never been to the park. Kyle was charged with capital murder. During the three-week trial, the four young men testified against Kyle and told the court that Officer Onufo was attempting to perform a pat-down search of Kyle when he shot the officer in the head. Kyle was no stranger to the court system. His record showed that he was charged with disorderly conduct and resisting a law enforcement officer just a few months earlier. The police soon found the gun used in the shooting, and it had Kyle's DNA. The gun had been stolen, along with a ring, during a home burglary a month earlier. The stolen ring was also found with Kyle. The defense attorneys argued that all the other men had made up the story. They also pointed out that Kyle's DNA could have been transferred to the gun. Before the jury left to begin deliberating, the judge asked Kyle one last time if he wanted to take the stand in his defense. He made a decision as to whether or not he wanted to take the stand. As he told the judge no, he broke into tears. Uh, take your time. It was the first time he'd shown any emotions during the trial. The jury was one day into deliberating when Kyle changed his mind about not testifying, but it was too late. The following day, the jury returned with a guilty verdict. Kyle shook his head as his family burst into tears. The jury still had to decide on Kyle's sentence. Arnulfo's family had been shocked by his cold demeanor during the trial. We looked at each other and I was expecting to maybe see some type of remorse. But actually what I got uh, was a smirk on his face and a smile as if like he was haunting like I, I'm gonna get away with this. At the sentencing hearing, they finally addressed this stone-cold killer face to face. He didn't care about Officer Crispin. He was only thinking of himself. He put his freedom above the life of this police officer. Arnulfo's sister wept as she talked about her brother and how much the day he had been murdered impacted her son. Yeah, it's not a day I don't think about Arnulfo in his love. And for JJ's birthday now, I always remind him of how much Arnulfo loved him. He was taken on his birthday and it breaks my heart to watch my son stare at his photo. Even Arnufo's captain's voice shook as he spoke about him. No reminder, no memorial plaque is more telling than a single chair that has leaned forward each night in Charlie Squad's briefing as they brief for their mission. Kyle's defense team pleaded for a lesser sentence. All people do things they wish they hadn't done. That is real life. They brought in his former teachers as character witnesses. I visited him because... Um, I care about him. He has good inside of him. He stood out in my mind because he always came in my room each day with, good morning, Mrs. Smith. How are you? His mother also took the stand last and made an emotional plea for leniency. He's a very wonderful child. He's a very special boy to me. Throughout the hearing, Kyle remained stone-faced and unmoved, showing no emotion. Even learning he'd escaped the death penalty did not change his features. The 21-year-old was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. 